China issues a new warning to the U.S. against siding with Taiwan, while China continues to use e-commerce apps to spy on American consumers. China expert and president of the Population Research Institute, Stephen Mosher, is here with analysis. And with over 50 percent of marriages ending in divorce, what are the best common sense ways to strengthen marriages before it's too late? Psychologist Dr. Ray Gorendi shares his insights in a new book, Simple Steps to a Stronger Marriage. The World Over begins right now. Now, Raymond Arroyo. A warm welcome to all of you joining us in the United States and the world over. If you'd like to comment on tonight's show, send me a tweet. I'm at Raymond Arroyo. Stephen Mosier is up next. But first, I had to mention this. This week marks the 42nd anniversary of the on-air launch of EWTN. It was on August 15th, 1981, on the Feast of the Assumption, that Mother Angelica threw the switch that started the network you're watching today. Often overlooked, however, is another important milestone. On that same day, August 15th, in 1944, 79 years ago, Rita Rizzo entered religious life at a monastery in Cleveland, Ohio. If young Rita hadn't made that crucial decision to devote her life to Christ, her spouse, EWTN, would never have existed. Mother Angelica once said, boldness should be the 11th commandment. Well, for her... It certainly was, and it is in her spirit of boldness and truth that we're able to bring you this show each week and that EWTN continues to touch so many lives around the world. We miss you, Reverend Mother. Rest in peace. Moving on to unpleasant news, the communist Chinese government issued new warnings to the U.S. and the world this week regarding its stance on Taiwan. And Chinese e-commerce companies appear to be using spyware to help the CCP surveil American consumers. What are they looking for? And there's some new developments on the case of the incarcerated Hong Kong businessman and democracy advocate Jimmy Lai. Joining me to discuss all of it and much more, president of the Population Research Institute, author of The Bully of Asia, Stephen Mosier. Steve, thanks for being here. I want to start with Jimmy Lai. According to reports, a Hong Kong court has granted what is being called a partial victory to Lai and six others charged with participating in the banned 2019 protest against the Chinese government. The court tossed out one of two charges against the seven men, finding they could not be held liable for organizing the protest. Uh, the court unanimously upheld the charge of participation, however. The AP released pictures of Lai in prison. We're going to put one up on the screen now. Steve, what are you hearing about this development? Well, this is only uh, uh, part of a, a series of charges that have been brought against Jimmy Lai. Now, the most serious charge was brought against him in 2020 after the national security law was imposed by the Chinese Communist Party on Hong Kong, not through the locally elected legislature, which is now just a rubber stamp parliament, but imposed by the Chinese Communist Party itself. Uh, Jimmy Lai was arrested on for violating the national security law by conspiring with foreign powers and so forth uh, a few weeks later. And he's been in solitary confinement uh, since then. They refused to let him out on bail. He's in a concrete cell, uh, unair conditioned in the tropical heat in Hong Kong, 23 hours a day. He's only allowed out for an hour of exercise in a very small, uh, you know, area uh, with top by barbed wire, about 16 by 30 feet. So uh, he is being punished already, uh, really, for doing for doing what I think every believing Catholic should do, and that is uh, speak out for freedom of conscience, for freedom of religion, and for human rights in general. Well, as you mentioned, he's in the middle of that 69-month sentence, uh, yeah. allegedly for fraud, stemming from uh, what they call improper use of Apple Daily's office space, I guess, to foment democratic activities. Will Jimmy Lai ever see the outside of prison, do you think, Steve? Well, I, I think he's quite clear uh, on the fact that he's, he's 
probably going to die in prison. He said back in an interview a couple of years ago, uh, Jimmy did, sitting in his house uh, with a picture of the Madonna and child behind him because he's a very faithful Catholic. He's a Catholic martyr of our mm -hmm. time. He said that I fully expect to die in prison. He said the Chinese Communist Party wants to rule by fear. I refuse to be afraid. And if that means that I must spend my life in prison, the rest of my life in prison, mm -hmm. uh, so be it. You know, everyone should know that 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 our Catholic faith, Raymond, as you know, is in direct and irreconcilable conflict with communism or any form of com uh, totalitarian government. In fact, the catechism says that totalitarian states systematically falsify the truth, exercise political control of opinion through the media, manipulate defendants and witnesses at public trials, and imagine they can secure their tyranny by strangling and repressing everything they consider to be thought crimes. Now. Jimmy Lai knows that, you know that, I know that, our listeners know that, the communists know that, uh, China's dictator Xi Jinping certainly knows that, so there'll be no quarter granted to Jimmy Lai or the people of Hong Kong. Sadly, uh, some mm -hmm. people in the back uh, seem to not be reading their catechism of late. Well, I, I urge all of our viewers, our listeners around the world to pray for Jimmy Lai, pray for his family. Um, they, they certainly could profit from that. And as you said, he is the martyr, whether white or otherwise, in this time. Um, also, this week, China engaged in some saber rattling, Steve, at the Moscow International Security Conference. The CCP's defense minister attended and announced a number of initiatives that China will expand military cooperation with Belarus and Iran, expand its international cooperation on arms control and what they call nuclear nonproliferation, and promote peace talks to resolve international conflicts in places like Ukraine. The minister said, quote, countries are increasingly interacting with each other in the global village, and it is inevitable that they encounter frictions here and there. What is important is to communicate openly and resolve differences. China has always advocated promoting mutual trust through dialogue, gathering similarities and resolving differences and conflicts, whether in Afghanistan, Syria, the Korean Peninsula, Ukraine, or Iran on the nuclear issue. China is committed to promoting peace and negotiations and building more international consensus. It breaks my heart to even read that, Steve. What is their end game here? No mention of cooperation with the U.S., and they appear to be taking it upon themselves to act as the lone global superpower here. Yeah, uh, well, let's, let's, let's uh, look beyond the smoke and mirrors. Uh, at the reality yeah. of what's happening. Uh, the reality is that we have fairly credible evidence that China is supplying Russia with military equipment and replacement parts for its weapons while it continues to attack Ukraine. So that's number one. They're not working for peace in Ukraine. They're working for the victory of their uh, newfound ally, Russia. Uh, as far as expanding uh, cooperation on nuclear non-proliferation, uh, China is engaging in the fastest and I think most worrisome buildup of its nuclear arsenal in history. Uh, they for years have claimed to be, uh, just have a few hundred nuclear weapons. They are going now for thousands. So that any treaty that doesn't include Russia, that's just between the United States and, uh, and, and, uh, and Russia, any treaty that does not include China, of course, uh, will be uh, useless because uh, China is building up a first strike nuclear arsenal. As far as peace, the saber rattling, the saber rattling really has been continual uh, since the founding of the People's Republic of China. Um, uh, they invaded Tibet in 1959. They took over Eastern Turkestan, Xinjiang, a few years before that. They invaded uh, Vietnam in 1979. Uh, they have taken over the South China Sea in the last 20 years. And they are now encircling Taiwan every day with fighters and bombers and uh, ships from the People's Liberation Army Navy. Uh, saber rattling, yes, on a daily basis. And even threatening Japan, mm. saying that the the islands, this, not just the Senkaku Islands, but Okinawa uh, was once a tributary state of China and should be again. That's a direct threat to Japan's sovereignty. And it doesn't stop there. Mm. You know, uh, communism is inherently expansionist. It is a cancer that keeps mm. spreading. And, uh, and so it will spread beyond Taiwan if they take Taiwan, beyond the South China Sea, to, to parts uh, closer to the United States.
It's good that you've mentioned that, Steve. China's defense minister also issued a warning to the international community and implicitly the United States that uh, all are playing with fire with Taiwan in order to, quote, contain China would be met with failure, he said. What is their game here? How much longer before China moves against Taiwan, do you think? Well, we, we understand that the dictator, communist dictator Xi Jinping, has set a timeline for the invasion and that the invasion is supposed to occur by 2026. Now, I think that he desperately wants to cement his legacy as the most important and fiercest ruler of China since Mao Zedong himself by actually taking Taiwan. So I do not, th I do not think this is an idle threat. I think that the fact that mm -hmm. we have caused uh, hundreds of millions of dollars of weapons to, to Taiwan, but have now postponed the delivery of those weapons for two or three years is a grave error. Weakness invites aggression. And right now, we need to bolster Taiwan's defenses to the maximum extent so that strength deters the possible aggression from China. If they know an invading fleet will be sunk in the Taiwan Straits, they will not attempt an invasion. Otherwise, I believe, Raymond, they will go ahead. Taiwan's Vice President William Lai visited the U.S. this week, almost got no coverage. He said, if Taiwan is safe, the world is safe. If the Taiwan Strait is peaceful, the world is peaceful. Now, China, naturally, has denounced Lai as a separatist troublemaker. Uh, VP Lai is a favorite to become the next president of Taiwan. What do you know about him? Can he be counted on to resist China's advance? And does he have U.S. support? Well, those are all very, very interesting questions. Uh, the first is, can he can't be counted on to, to protect Taiwan from China? Yes. Uh, he is a member of what was once known as the Independence Party, the Democratic Progressive Party of Taiwan. And they are absolutely committed to, re to retaining Taiwan's de facto, de facto independence. Uh, as to whether we would defend Taiwan if it were attacked, I'm hoping that won't be necessary by building up Taiwan's own defenses. But should it come to that, it all depends on who is in the Oval Office. Uh, we have heard uh, conflicting signals, uncertain trumpets from the Biden administration with the president saying one thing and his lower ranking officials saying another. So it's difficult to know who's in charge and what our policy is towards Taiwan right now. But we need to keep Taiwan free, not just for the sake of the 24 million people on Taiwan, who enjoy a free market economy, who enjoy freedom of speech, freedom of religion, freedom of association, free elections, which they have one coming up, but also because it is important part of the defense perimeter around China, containing China that stretches from South Korea through Japan, through Taiwan, down to the Philippines, down to Indonesia, Vietnam, and uh, Australia, New Zealand. If you lose Taiwan, the People's Liberation Army Navy of Communist China has direct access to the open ocean, the open waters of the Pacific, and the next stop is Guam and then Hawaii. So keeping Taiwan as part of that defensive perimeter is very important to our own national security. Yeah. Another story we've been following, Steve, is uh, China's e-commerce apps. Uh, apparently used by American and international shoppers. Here's the problem. Shopping apps with ultra-low prices like Timu seem to be cooperating with the CCP by mining data from U.S. consumers. Steve, tell us what's going on here. What is the CCP using that data for? Well, uh, uh, first of all, uh, Raymond, there are no private companies in China. Every company in China is either owned by, run by, or or influenced by, behind the scenes, by the Chinese Communist Party, which has a 2017 mm -hmm. intelligence law saying that every company in China must turn over data important to national security to the Chinese Communist Party's intelligence services. So when you see a China app, regardless of what the company pur purports to be, it is a data mining operation. Uh, if you download a China app, it will ransack the data on your phone, your photographs, your contacts, and you buy anything, it, it takes your financial information. It all goes into supercomputers in China, where they are building up a database for everyone, I think, not just in China, but in wider parts of the world and in the United States. Now, I don't want to be doing business with 
Chinese Communist Party, so I won't buy anything from an app like Timu because they're all goods produced in China. And uh, again, no private companies in China, so you're doing business with China. I won't buy anything made in China because the products themselves are often unsafe. They contain, for example, high levels of lead or heavy metals. And I won't buy products in China because they're often made by slave labor. Anything made out of cotton from China is coming from Xinjiang, the Uyghur territory, where they are being treated as literal slaves working in the cotton plantation, planting and picking cotton. And then the workers in the factories on the East Coast, the export factories, are not much better off. Four cents a garment, producing 500 garments a day, is uh, is one of the assignments that garment workers have in China. That's 12, 13 hours a day, day after day, uh, 30 days a month. Uh, that's that's mm. sweat labor. That's the sweatshop that makes the 18th century British sweatshops uh, look like paradise in comparison. Steve, what other apps should people be concerned about? I mean, beyond Timu, uh, China continues to meddle and interfere with social media networks. I mean, we've certainly heard reports about TikTok and how they, as you mentioned, ransack people's private information. Well, and, and TikTok is even worse than that, because TikTok in the United States and in Europe is a very different TikTok than you see in China. In China, the mm. social media is very carefully controlled by the Chinese Communist Party, not just to put the party in a good light, but to make sure that children in China do not spend too much time on social media. There are limits on the number of hours they can be on to make sure they don't see anything that might be harmful to them, uh, such as pornography, mm. which is banned in China. And, and so if you go on the TikTok in China, you don't see um, social media influencers, men who pretend to be women. Uh, but that is promoted, not just allowed, but promoted on TikTok in the United States. And you have to ask yourself why. And I think the answer is they're trying to destroy uh, the moral fiber of our country. They're trying to weaken the family. Uh, they're trying to, uh, to corrupt small children. Uh, they're doing anything they can really to weaken the United States because China's um, plan is called unrestricted warfare. And they are literally at war with us across all domains from cyberspace to outer space in order to weaken and replace us as the dominant power on the planet. And it's really no holds barred. And China has a 100 year plan ending in 2049, by which time it intends to be the dominant power on the planet. And they are methodically pursuing that plan year by year, mm. app by app, uh, social media post by social media post. Mm. Uh, also in headlines this week, Steve, the forced repatriation of North Korean refugees from China back to North Korea, where they now face torture and death. Human rights groups have criticized the U.N. for what they are, were calling unacceptable silence on the issue. Now the U.N. is expressing grave concern over the matter. Uh, the Chinese government labels North Koreans as illegal M economic migrants and forcibly repatriates them as a matter of routine. Why the initial silence from the UN? Seems like another case of giving China a pass when it comes to human rights. Yes, except that uh, for the last 30 years, the Chinese Communist Party has made a concerted effort to place its officials in junior and increasingly senior positions within the UN structure. It is a highly organized, uh, well-funded project and has resulted in, uh, in, in, in a huge presence of the Chinese Communist Party within UN organizations and effectively defanging them when it comes to human rights issues. I mean, you've got a human rights council at the UN, which has uh, uh, states like uh, one, of the, one of the worst violators of human rights in the world serve on the Human Rights Commission of the United Nations. And for the most part, they do China's bidding. So you will, you will get no criticism of China from UN agencies. But the other thing this tells you is the Chinese economy is in very, very bad shape. Because in years past, they would have welcomed uh, the North Koreans who came across the border, who went to work in Chinese factories. Right. Now there aren't enough jobs uh, for the Chinese people themselves. The youth unemployment rate is at 25, 30%. Uh, and so they're now arresting these economic migrants and sending them back across the border to North Korea. But defecting, going across the border illegally, is, is a traitorous act to North Korean dictators. And uh, these people will be sent immediately to, to prison. 
and uh, will probably not survive the experience. Steve, that's a great segue to this important question. Demographers say that China's fertility rate dropped to a new low in 2022, according to China Population and Development Research Center, down to 1.09 children per family. Now, this is the lowest rate among countries with more than 100 million people. Hong Kong's Family Planning Association says the number of couples without children has reached alarming levels, over 43 percent. Steve, is a demographic nightmare on the horizon for China? Oh, absolutely. China's dying. And it's dying at the hands of the Chinese Communist Party, which, of course, embarked on a one-child policy uh, on the misguided understanding that people were a burden, babies were a blessing, and not a blessing, but a burden. Um, and over the last uh, 40 years, they have eliminated, by forced abortion mostly, 400 million children from their population. Now, those children today would have grown up, the children born in the 80s and 90s would have grown up to be productive citizens, but they're gone. Half of the last two generations of Chinese were killed in utero or shortly after birth. And now the Chinese Communist Party is waking up to the consequences. Now, China has one of the lowest birth rates in the world, as you mentioned, but those are official figures, Raymond. I don't trust any official figures coming out of China. I think mm -hmm. the real numbers in China are closer to the numbers out of Hong Kong less than one child per woman over her reproductive lifetime. You can still right now trust the numbers out of Hong Kong uh, more than you can trust the numbers out of China. So I believe the true birth rate in China, because of the economic downturn, because so many little girls were killed by sex selective abortion and female infanticide, because marriage rates are way down, um, the real birth rate in China is below one and falling. It may stabilize at 0.8 children per woman over their reproductive lifetime, but that's a recipe for demographic suicide. You're losing more than half your population mm -hmm. each generation at that rate. And if that rate continues, Raymond, by the year 2080, there will be more Americans than there are Chinese. Hmm. And what happens economically? What are the economic consequences? We always hear, oh, the economy is about to tank. I just read a story about this, and it's tied to the demography. Do you buy those stories? Oh, I think, I think China has an economic nightmare on its hands for several reasons. One is demography, right? You killed off mm -hmm. 400 million of the most productive, enterprising people on the planet, and you think you're better off? No you crippled your economic growth for the foreseeable future. Secondly, Americans have woken up to the China threat. 85% of Americans see China as a threat. Most Europeans are following close behind. The amount of goods that we're buying from China is now at a 20 year low. It is falling into the cellar. And guess what? The only sector of the Chinese economy that really works that produces a profit is the export sector. If they lose that sector of the economy, the rest of the economy is white elephants, state-owned enterprises. They lose money. They hemorrhage red ink. You know, they bleed red ink year after year. Wow. Uh, if they lose the export sector, which they're in danger of doing, then the economy will tank. Finally, you've got this bubble in the housing market in China. You know, 60% of the wealth of China is in apartment buildings and, and retail complexes. Uh, the bottom is falling out of that market. And when the collapse comes, and it'll come more suddenly than anyone imagines, it will be disastrous for the Chinese economy. Now, that doesn't mean that we're out of the woods as far as the China threat is concerned. I think right. the coming collapse of China actually makes China more dangerous rather than less dangerous, at least over the short term. Yeah. Steve, uh, since you were last here, Pope Francis accepted China's pick for the Bishop of Shanghai, Joseph Shenbin. Um, Francis also elevated the Bishop of Hong Kong, Stephen Chow, to Cardinal. Now, Chow is the successor of uh, Cardinal Joseph Zen, been here so many times, the tireless advocate for religious freedom in China. Your thoughts on these, uh, the only nice way to call them is capitulations to the CCP and the current state of this China-Vatican pact, which still remains a secret agreement. Yes, it, it, it does, uh, surprisingly, even though it's now, a, uh, I think, a dead letter, clearly. Uh, I, I, got, I have to say that Cardinal Zen, whom you just mentioned, and Jemmy Lai are, are holy warriors. 
They need our prayers. They're undergoing tremendous trials for speaking out on behalf of the God-given rights of the people of China and Hong Kong. As far as Cardinal uh, Joe, I hope that uh, uh, things work out well. I do know that he's been at democracy uh, protests in the past. I do know that he's been at the uh, the memorial ceremonies, uh, candlelighting ceremonies for the victims of the Tiananmen massacre. So I'm hoping that he stays strong. Uh, as far as uh, the the new bishop of Shanghai. Uh, that was a fait accompli by the Chinese Communist Party against the Vatican. Uh, they didn't consult with the Vatican. They simply moved this bishop into that post. And after temporizing for three months, uh, the Vatican was finally, I think, had its hand forced and accepted uh, him as the legitimate bishop of, uh, of, of Shanghai. So that tells you all you need to know about the Sino-Vatican Agreement, which was supposed to be an agreement for the two sides to cooperate on the appointment of bishops. Obviously, the China side is not cooperating. It is simply imposing bishops on the Vatican, and the Vatican now is simply being forced to accept them. Stephen Mosier, we will leave it there. As always, the current edition of Bully of Asia by Stephen is available at bookstores everywhere. Stephen, thanks for being here. Thank you, Raymond. According to recent statistics, over half of marriages in the U.S. end in divorce. What are the leading stressors in those relationships that cause marriages to fail? And how can couples avoid the mistake that can often doom a relationship? My next guest is a clinical psychologist, longtime host of The Doctor Is In on EWTN Radio. He's also the father of 10 adopted children, and he's here tonight to offer some techniques to strengthen your marriage and share his appropriately titled new book, Simple Steps to a Stronger Marriage. Please welcome Dr. Ray Gurendi. Ray, thanks for being here. Uh, I want to start with the CDC statistics. Nearly 700,000 couples in the U.S. reported divorce in 2021 alone. That's about half of the number of marriages reported that same year. What, in your experience as a marriage and family counselor, uh, uh, what is driving those numbers and the, the high rates of divorce? I want to preface this, Raymond, by saying I'm getting a little tired of having to write books just to get on your show. <laughs> Well, that's how that's the that that's the fast pass. You write a book, you get to come on if it's a good book. And so you pass the first part of the test. We'll see how long this interview lasts. A lot of those stats are second marriages, third marriages. The statistics on second mm. marriage is 66 percent. The statistics on third is 90 percent. So that's a bit skewed. Better stats are about 40 percent of first time marriages end in divorce. It's still pathetic. Why is this? Overall, one, you give God the boot. You don't have the commitment. Multiple secular studies indicate as religion goes, marriage goes. That's straightforward. Mm. Yeah, no, that's, that's so important. And again, a component rarely discussed or mentioned, but there is that third person in the marriage that, that you need to consider and welcome in early on. Uh, let's talk for a moment about some of the most common reasons given for divorce. Uh, these include things like career choices, parenting differences, division of household labor, uh, relationships with family and friends, and finances, according to a Forbes survey. The top two reasons given were career choices and parenting differences. Does that mesh with what you see in your practice? About 80% of marriages, Raymond, end because I don't like you anymore. I don't want to be mm. around you. I don't want to live with you anymore. That's about 80% of them. Mm. The bulk of marriages don't have severe pathology. There isn't alcoholism, there isn't abuse, there isn't mental disorder. For the most part, it's two people who have stopped getting along. One of those areas, of course, is what do I do with my career and what do we do with these kids? Interestingly enough, Raymond, we live in a culture that says you can have sexual relationships with anybody, anytime, anywhere, just don't have more than 1.86 children in marriage, then we will belittle you. Mm. Another interesting finding, and it brings us nicely to your book, 63% of divorced couples said having 
a better grasp of commitment prior to getting married could have helped them avoid divorce. Only 5% of couples said their marriages were irretrievably broken. Dr. Ray, tell us about simple steps to a stronger marriage. Why did you write it now? And are they right? What can you do to strengthen that bond, if you will, that understanding of commitment before you start the marriage? A parent will walk into my office totally frustrated by their seven-year-old. There's no affection. There's no connection. They don't like being a parent to this child. I will give them a couple quick suggestions to try before the next time we meet. 50% of the time, Raymond, they will come back and they will say, I can't believe this. I'm living with a different child. He's more affectionate. He's happier. We fight less. I said, all I did was give you a couple simple steps. It was a cascade effect, Raymond. That's what I call it, which is these tiny little things you can do to improve your marriage have a reverberating effect throughout the whole marriage. Here's the problem. Hmm. Any psychologist will tell you the hardest part of doing therapy is not so much knowing how to guide somebody. The hard part is convincing them to do it. In the book, I spend about 80% hmm. of my time convincing the people this is good for you to do for your marriage and for you. Yeah. And, and you include a counseling scenario at the end of each chapter, which I like. W why did you decide to structure it that way? And uh, how have readers responded? I'm sure they've called into the radio show and told you. Well, my mom thinks it's one of the best books she's ever read. So <laughs> that's good. That's a good thing. <laughs> she didn't think that of the first few books. So this one she did. The reason I put those scenarios at the end is because people want real life stuff. They want to look at mm -hmm. how things unfold. You don't want to just write a narrative and say, okay, here's what you do. Mm -hmm. You want to say, this is reality. Right. This is what you can expect. And here's a way to smooth this out. That's why I jump into the scenarios and I give suggestions on the spot. In your introduction, you write this, to be sure some marriages are seriously disturbed. They're plagued by major psychiatric disorders, spousal or child abuse, infidelity, alcohol, and substance abuse. Overall, though, you mentioned this earlier, most struggling unions are not marked by severe pathologies. They are more accurately termed daily discontented. Overall, husband and wife want their marriage to work once they loved each other with more fervor, but their problems mounted over time and they drifted apart or his life brought more stressors. Uh, Dr. Ray, uh, explain what you mean by daily discontentment and how can falling into that trap of complacency, giving up, best be avoided? Raymond, are you familiar with the physics law, the law of entropy? Have you heard of it? It means everything decays, right? There is a parallel yeah. in marriages. I call it the law of social entropy. We get sloppy, mm. we get lazy. We don't use manners like we used to. We don't compliment like we used to. We certainly don't say I'm sorry. It's not so much necessarily that there's overt hostility. It's that we just drift into a sense of mm. social apathy in a marriage. And that's what takes a lot of them down. The effort that needs mm. to be put in is not there anymore. It's complacent. Yeah, as I read the book, I kept thinking, you know, that old that old song, little things mean a lot. You know, that's really that's the whole that's the whole game. You cover uh, a few of these simple steps in your book, and I want to dive into a few of them. Uh, let's start at the beginning. And you mentioned it a moment ago saying I'm sorry. How can sincere apologies improve a marriage and why does that go sideways, do you think? I'll ask clients in my office, when is the last time either one of you said, I'm sorry? And I'll get answers like, uh, well, uh, when, our, uh, when our child was in kindergarten. Well, how old's your child now? Oh, she's in law school. Well, uh, wedding rehearsal dinner. Uh, I spilled uh, coffee on her napkin and said, sorry about that. So you quickly realize, Raymond, that I'm sorry is about as pleasant in their marriage as a root canal. So given that, mm. One of the main reasons people don't say, I'm sorry, this is a big one, and most folks don't realize this in a marriage. If I can't say I'm sorry to you, it's because in my mind, I'm sorry doesn't mean for what I did at that time. It means hmm. you're better than me. 
It means I'm wrong, you're right. It means I'm inferior to you. It means I'm a failure. We fill it up with all kinds of extraneous psychological meaning so we won't say I'm sorry because it means too much. There's something I call the personal apology percentage in the book. And this Raymond essentially says, how wrong do you have to be before you will say, I'm sorry? Now, for most people, it's 50% or more. But in fact, especially among Christians, you should apologize for whatever percentage independent of whether the other person says I'm sorry for their 94%. What I really like about the book is the common sense approach to communication. You know, like knowing when to hold your tongue, uh, knowing the value of silence and listening. Uh, talk for a moment about silence. How does silence complement listening to one's partner? A and this should not be confused with the silent treatment. <laughs> yes. There's two ways, Raymond. There's two levels. The first one is most of the time when people say things they regret, it's at a moment of peak emotional surge. Mm. I'm upset. It's going to come out of my mouth. And later on when I cool down. So one of the steps is when you most feel like saying it, delay, hold for 20 seconds mm. and the physiological urge, believe it or not, will taper enough for you to control it. That's the one level. The other level is this. Somebody will come in my office and the woman will say, he does not stick up for me with his mother. I'll turn to the guy. Do you know why she thinks that? No. How long you been married? 24 years. Have you ever listened to why she thinks that? As a shrink, Raymond, I have to listen to people. And what I hear may shock me it may make me tremble inside, but I have to listen. I have to understand what's going on in their head. Mm -hmm. Spouses have to understand what's going on in the other person's head. You may not agree with it. You may think it's ridiculous. You may think it's irrational and neurotic, but you gotta at least understand it. Most people wanna be understood even more than they wanna be agreed with. Speak to something Mother Angelica used to talk about, and it was, you have to be in the present moment, and so many of us are living in the past or concerned and anxious about the future. What impact does that mode of thinking have on a marriage when you're, you're just ruminating, digging through the yesterdays, or so anxious about the future, you're paralyzed? I had a lady call me on the radio show. She said, my husband has not said I'm sorry in 52 years of marriage. Do you still get yourself upset over this? Yes. Why? Because he's never said, I'm sorry. I said, well, you already know after five decades, he's not going to say, I'm sorry. When will you accept that? When will you say that is what he is, that is who he is, therefore, I'm not going to look into the past and say, why doesn't he change? He can't, he can't make it any better. So, Typically in marriages, one of the big things, Raymond, is that we cling. We cling to former behaviors that hurt us. We don't let them go. We just, we just grasp it and we make ourselves miserable. You write about something in the book called dumping the D word, divorce. Talk about the cavalier use of that word, particularly in a strugg struggling marriage and how it can be devastating. The, the D word is the big club. If you don't realize how unhappy I am, Maybe I'll start saying things like, well, uh, we, uh, maybe we're just better off apart. I think we ought to relook at this marriage and see if we were made for each other. So what we do is I'm going to threaten you with this because I'm going to shake you up. The problem with that, once you let that word enter your vocabulary, it becomes a possibility. Once you do that, you crack the door open to that option. Soon as couples come in my office, I will ask one very quick question. Is divorce an option? If they say no, I will say good. Now we can each do what we need to do, whatever it takes to make this marriage work. Mm. But if I have that option to get out of this, I'll only work at this so hard because I can leave.
You devote a chapter to good old fashioned manners uh, in dealing with a spouse. How can something as simple as good manners save a struggling marriage? And why is that forgotten, do you think? Many spouses don't have the manners of a five-year-old. <laughs> Five-year-olds out in public get something from somebody. What do you say? What's the magic word? Many parents grab them and say, say thank you. We expect manners from five-year-olds. But in a marriage, we get very sloppy with our spouses. Hey, uh, give me a cup of coffee, would you? We don't say please. When somebody has a meal that was prepared by a spouse, thank you. Boy, that was good. Thank you. Please, thank you. Those kinds of things express dignity, and we get sloppy with them. It's part of that law of social entropy, Raymond. We just get sloppy. We don't, we don't use the manners of a five-year-old with our spouses. Talk to me for a moment about the small step of touch, how important a touch as a part of physical affection, as a barometer of the health of a relationship. There was a study done. They studied waitresses. And they noted that if a waitress touched a customer, that's all, nothing, nothing sexual, just hand on the shoulder, anything like that, they got 33% more tips. <laughs> touch conveys, yeah, I know. I'm, I, touch conveys acceptance. A touch says a lot more silently than what I'd say with my mouth. And I'm amazed at how many people in my office come in and I ask them, when was the last time you had relations? A year and a half ago. When was the last time you hugged? Mm. <laughs> uh, when, when does Halley's Comet come around? Every, every 76 years, I think it is, <laughs> something like that. They've given up. I, I tell guys, okay, if you're going to leave the house, say you're going to work, just touch your wife goodbye. It doesn't have to be anything fancy. Just touch her goodbye. Oh, I'm not an affectionate guy. Well, you don't have to be an affectionate guy. A touch is a, touch is a step this big. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, you know, but your first example, though, touching the waitress, that can land you in HR. So I wasn't talking about that kind of touch. I meant to touch at home with your spouse. That, so let me just be, I have to be very clear and put that for, I take all these seminars on harassment. And you got to be very careful today, Dr. Ray, very careful. According to one survey you cite in the book, when couples contemplating separation who stayed together were asked five years later about their relationship, 86% uh, reported it was much improved. For anyone watching who might be in a difficult marriage, how can just being patient sometimes be the key to overcoming difficulties in a marriage? What would you tell people who don't think they can carry on any longer? There's another part to that study, Raymond. They asked those folks right on the edge of divorce who got divorced. Five years later, they said, are you happier now than you were when you were married? Are you more stressed now than you were when you were married? Half of them mm. said that they are more unhappy now than they were when they were married. This is what I do in the mm. office. People will say to me, how do you deal with someone who doesn't have any kind of moral commitment? Their view is, mm. I don't like this. I met somebody else. I'm out of here. How do you deal with that? I said, well, one of the things I do is I walk them through the complications. So you have three children. Your daughter's what, 16? Uh, do you think she'll uh, have a relationship with you uh, for breaking up her family? Oh no, she's already not talking to me. I see. Well, this uh, woman that you're with, does she have children? Oh yeah, she's got an eight-year-old and six-year-old and they're both obnoxious little brats. Oh, do you think she'll allow you to discipline them? And what happens if you have a child by her? Do you think there'll be some favoritism mm. you'll have to struggle with? I just walk them through the complications of this and it indicates what can happen five years down the road when you think you're getting out of a bad marriage only to jump into a much more complicated situation. You've already lost two of your kids well, I, who won't talk to you because they're mad at you. Right. And now you're in a worse situation than you were before, uh, to say nothing of the payouts every month. Uh, I want to mention for a moment, because you brought it up earlier, <laughs> and, and it's an important theme in the book. Tell me about faith, the power of faith, not only in a marriage, but 
to help in the reconciliation of a marriage and to avoid divorce? It's very straightforward, Raymond. The studies are clear. If one spouse is faith-filled, the marriage has a much longer chance of success. If both spouses are faith-filled, the divorce rate is much, much lower. As a matter of fact, for example, among those spouses who practice natural family planning, the divorce rate is under 5%. The natural family planning indicates that they take their faith very seriously. So in fact, I'm committed to this marriage and I'm going to do what it takes to make it work. There's a place in the book where I say the number one way to change your spouse is to change you first. Now, people resist that, Raymond. They don't like looking at themselves first. But if you change you, and if you believe in a savior who says you need to be a better person, a better disciple, most spouses are going to respond at some level. They may not respond as much as you had hoped, but they are going to respond unless they're Satan. They will indeed start to be a little easier to get along with. Before we run out of time, what advice would you offer to single people out there who may be considering marriage, how can they prepare themselves? Also, those who might be engaged. I have a son who's about to get married. Uh, not that I'm asking for free advice for him. I think he's okay. But uh, about what the commitment to marriage requires before you say yes. Excuse me, Raymond, just one second. Hey, guys, start the, start the, uh, the money thing on this for Raymond. Yeah, we're just, we're just starting the <laughs> clock on it, Raymond, okay? If I'm giving you this <laughs> <Okay>. advice. <laughs> They say opposites attract, that's false. Opposites attract mm. if you want an exciting relationship short term. Likes attract. I have seen many marriages fail because they didn't get to know each other enough and they didn't have enough commonality. The first commonality is mm. faith. If you're marrying somebody that you think that you're gonna bring around to the faith, good luck. That's the first thing. Secondly, mm -hmm. Take the time you need to really get to know this person. And by the way, you won't get to know them by living together because the stats are real clear on that. Divorces are much higher when you live together first. That's a given. That shatters that cliche. Secondly, make sure this person views life as you do. Children, finances, family parenting, people around them, the sphere. But most important, Raymond, and this is the toughest part now with young people who are faith-filled, is to find a potential spouse who takes the faith like you do that is getting much tougher. Well, your book, Simple Steps to a Stronger Marriage by Dr. Ray Garendi, is available at bookstores everywhere online, including EWTN's catalog, EWTNRC.com. Last week, I unveiled the cover of my new Turnabout Tale, a historic picture book, The Magnificent Mischief of Tad Lincoln. It tells the largely lost story of the president's youngest son, who not only was a source of comfort and joy to his father in his darkest moments, but together, Abraham Lincoln and Tad Lincoln established a national holiday tradition we continue to this day. It's really a story of mercy and forgiveness and the power of a child in a parent's life and in the life of a nation. The perfect holiday book, and it's available for pre-order now at the EWTN catalog, Amazon, Barnes & Noble, wherever books are sold. It goes on sale October 3rd, The Magnificent Mischief of Tad Lincoln. I know you and your family are going to love it, and it's the latest in my Turnabout Tales series. And I have another little Christmas surprise for you. I've been working on more on that in the weeks ahead. Very excited to share it with you. I think you'll enjoy it. My next guest is an executive evangelist and member of the International Bible Society Advisory Board. He, along with the Ramon Pane Foundation, has compiled a new book, God With Us, it is the story of Jesus told in sequential form from all four Gospels. It was unveiled recently to the young people gathered in Lisbon for World Youth Day. 
here to tell us more about this novel approach to making the gospel message more accessible to young people is Roger Kwai. I want to begin with the state of faith among today's young people. Statistics show us that among the young, between 15 and 25, Catholic and evangelical, less than half believe in Christ as the source of salvation. Why do we need to blend, do you think, the four Gospels into one sequential story, as you've done here? Well, first let me say uh, hello, Raymond. Thank you for inviting me on your show. I think today young yeah. people are so besieged by secular ideas that they're like the lost sheep, and we want to introduce them to the Good Shepherd. And we want to inspire them to follow the message and live an example of Jesus in their own lives. Now, if you look at the Gospels, they don't tell the complete story of Jesus and the message that he, he taught in any one Gospel. Uh, for example, the story of the birth of Jesus, you find Mary's story in Luke and Joseph's story in Matthew. So um, when, we, uh, when I was working with a young couple that were going through adult baptism and confirmation, we were asked to read the book of Luke through them because there's lots of questions asked. Uh, the young woman knew very little about the Bible or Jesus. And so I kept finding myself referring to the other Gospels to answer those questions. And it came to me the thought, well, why doesn't someone simply take the whole story of all the details of Jesus' life and message and put it together into one narrative like a biography? That's what we did. Mm. I thought it was a novel idea at mm. the time. I later discovered that Tatian had first done that in 160 AD, and it's been done many times since. But this was the first time we did it with a modern Catholic a Bible translation that's easy to read for young people. Mm. You just returned from Lisbon. Uh, God with us was uh, unveiled there to the young people gathered for World Youth Day. What did you encounter, and how did the young people there react to this presentation of the Gospels in sequential order? It was an amazing event. Uh, I think I last read that it was about one and a half million people by the end of the week. So there were events going all over the city. Uh, as part of the unveiling, we had a, a video teaser that we showed that uh, introduced the book and offered a free sample uh, that people could download. And that free sample is still available today to your viewers on our website, godwithus.live. Uh, that addresses some of the questions on young people's minds, like, who is Jesus? Does God really care? How can I make a difference in the life? Um, and we included that video on a, uh, a laser show that was projected onto a building in a city square, and that was amazing. You know, loud, uh, loud music, lights, the kids loved it. And um, I, I found that people were very excited by the possibility of having a, a tool like this for new evangelization of young people. I, there were people from mm. all over the world there. And for example, there were some uh, priests from Latin America who, who loved to have a tool like this to take back to their parishes to use with their young people, to get them engaged with the mm. Word of God. And you know, and the uh, response is still going on. I got a, um, an email from uh, someone in China who wants to use the book to teach people English. Now, this is written with a very easy to read uh, Bible translation, so it's perfect for people that English is a second language who want to learn about Jesus. What, what is the Bible translation, Roger, that you all use here? This, is, this one is called the Radiate, which was um, developed for young people. It's uh, not been published yet. It was developed by a collaboration of Catholic and Protestant scholars, and it's written to be appealing to young people, not for liturgical use, but basically to use a much simpler language and everyday language mm -hmm. in order to um, introduce them to the Bible. You have said that today's young people often resemble the lost sheep of Israel from Jesus' day. How are today's young people uh, who may have been raised Christian, uh, been distracted from the practice and understanding of the faith, how do you reach them? I mean, this is really a mission territory. Absolutely. It's a mission territory, indeed. And it's sad to see young people leaving the church. And I think we have to reach them where they're at. Um, and it was interesting to see at the event um, in, in Lisbon, uh, uh, Many, many times the modern methods are used them, like pop concerts, etc., that got them where they're at now. And, and, and media, we had um, all sorts of attractions to bring them into the square that uh, my partner, Foundation Pine, uh, staged, including um, uh, very energetic bands from the UK and uh, Germany um, that played uh, very lively music. The kids loved it. And then uh, 
and then Jesus from the Chosen series showed up and said a few words. So that's the sort of thing that get them uh, attracted uh, to to the setting. And once there, they they actually heard the gospel message, and also the um, they had um, events like uh, adoration services and more traditional uh, church events and, and discussions. So I think trying to reach them first where they are, bring them an engaging message, and that's why we wrote this book to look like a biography rather than the Bible to get them introduced to the Good Shepherd, to Jesus, and to inspire them to follow him, read and follow his message. Roger, what do you want young readers to take away from uh, God with us, and what do you hope to achieve? I hope to achieve, as I said already, inspire them to follow the message and live an example of Jesus, to take that message and spread, the, spread it around, to, to see Jesus as someone who can transform their lives. Uh, we want to follow up um, after World Youth Day uh, with reaching out to young people, put on workshops for, to train uh, youth leaders from dioceses, parishes and schools to be able to reach mm. young people. And to do that, we want to add media, video, audio, etc., to the book and use that to provide material to some of the parishes where they have uh, difficulty reaching young people to get them into the church even, uh, let alone keep them there. Uh, for example, this, this series of workshops uh, where we're looking at important questions, life questions on young people's minds could be an adjunct to confirmation classes and get them to see Jesus, how his message applies today, not just 2,000 years ago. Roger, before we go, what's the website again? The website is www.godwithus.live, L-I-V-E. Roger Quiet, thank you for being with us. God With Us is available at Amazon and at the website Roger just mentioned, godwithus.live. Thank you, Roger. Well, that is all the time we have for now. Be sure to catch us next week. Until then, we'll be scouting the world over for all that is seen and unseen. On behalf of the staff and crew of EWTN News, thank you for watching. I'm Raymond Arroyo. Bye now.